Hi, thank you for watching Dig Into China. I'm Dong Xiong. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. On August 30th, the Chinese government unveiled the latest edition of its national map, commonly referred to as the Standard Map. However, this release sparked immediate discontent among neighboring countries, leading to condemnations with the harshest criticism coming from three nations. Firstly, Taiwan's response was predictable as it reaffirmed that it does not consider itself part of China, a stance that has long been a source of tension. Secondly, India reacted formally and diplomatically. India's foreign minister personally protested, objecting to China's inclusion of Indian territory within its borders on the map. India also criticized China for its recurring habit of asserting claims over the territories of other nations. The Indian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Bakshi issued a statement, a statement asserting that such claims lacked a basis in reality, and India firmly rejected them. India believed that China's actions would only exacerbate border disputes. Thirdly, Malaysia, a country that had typically maintained a more conciliatory approach toward China, expressed unexpectedly strong dissatisfaction. The Malaysian Foreign Ministry released a public statement after the map's publication, asserting that China's sovereignty claims over the South China Sea as depicted in the 2023 standard map encompassed Malaysian maritime territories. Malaysia clarified that it did not acknowledge these claims and emphasized the complexity and sensitivity of the South China Sea issue. Malaysia urged for a peaceful and a rational resolution of the dispute through dialogue and adherence to international law. Furthermore, the map also affected Vietnam and the Philippines, but these two nations did not formally voice their objections. On the same day, an article in Newsweek reported that the latest standard map released by the Chinese Communist Party had incorporated a segment of Russian territory. According to the Chinese perspective, this specific territory had always been considered a part of China. Which territory are we referring to? It's the area covered by the 2004 territorial agreement between Jiang Zemin and Russia which drew a line through Bolshoi Ussuriski Island, dividing it equally between China and Russia. In this new map edition, Bolshoi Ussuriski Island has been entirely labeled as Chinese territory. This essentially alters existing border arrangement between China and Russia. The impact extends beyond the Bolshoi Ussuriski Island to encompass some adjacent waters. From the standpoint of the international community, this territorial dispute between China and Russia now appears equally surprising, alongside China's territorial dispute with Taiwan, India, and Malaysia. The Newsweek article reads, what today is called the Russian Far East was part of Qing Empire until 1860. The Convention of Peking stipul uh, stipulated in 1860 that the boundary between China and Russia was along the Amur and Ussuri rivers, at whose confluence lies Bolshoi Ussuriski. In 1929, the Soviet Union occupied it as well as the neighboring Yinglong Islands, which was not accepted by China. Border disputes have been a major source of animosity between China and Russia. For years, the two nations have disputed ownership of Bolshoi Ussuriski, known as Black Bear Island in Chinese. In 2004, both nations come to an agreement on the matter after almost four decades of talks. As part of that historical agreement, Russia handed over Tara Barov and a part of Bolshoi Ussuriski Island, with China agreeing not to claim more territory from Russia. In a comment to Russia's ambassador in China in 2005, Putin hailed the deal as laying a solid foundation for long-term historical prospects. 
The settlement paved the way for the two countries to strengthen and improve bilateral strategic relations. In May, Russian opposition politician Garry Kasparov told Newsweek he expected China to make greater claims on Russian territory in future, especially if, as he has predicted, there is a collapse of Russia that Beijing can exploit. He said that Xi might seek to readdress the outcomes of historical treaties signed when China was weak and Russia, as every other imperial power, tried to carve out pieces of China. Reports from Russian official media indicate that the Kremlin did not react as swiftly as some of China's other neighboring countries did. Interviews conducted by the Newsweek with scholars from American think tanks generally suggest that China's new version of the map reveals new divisions between Beijing and the Kremlin. It's important to note that Putin's lack of immediate response doesn't necessarily imply acceptance or indifference on this part. On his part, the Kremlin has consistently paid close attention to China's maps, especially official ones. Russia's Foreign Minister Lavrov has made a repeated assurance to the Russian people in the Far East that the Russian government will not yield even an inch of territory and will not cede any land to China. The official Chinese standard map, which has redrawn the border between China and Russia, undoubtedly constitutes a significant political development in the relationship between the two countries. Some individuals may question, it, it is just a map published by the China Map Publishing House and distributed by the Ministry of Natural Resources of China. Could there be uh, printing errors or technical issues? Are there alternative, alternative versions of the map? Does it truly reflect the official standpoint or is there room for ambiguity? The answer is no. On August 30th, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs officially addressed external inquiries, underscoring that the new map version has received formal confirmation at the national level by the Chinese Communist Party. This isn't a mere printing error or a publishing house matter. It unequivocally represents the stance of the nation. During a press conference, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin made the following statement. The release of the 2023 edition of the Standard Map is a regular exercise in asserting sovereignty in accordance with the law. We hope that the relevant parties will objectively and calmly consider it without reading too much into it. Wang Wenbin's response has politically and officially defined this issue, signifying the position of the central Chinese government. This is not the result of deliberate actions by Chinese nationalists or populist publishers. It represents the stance of the Chinese Communist Party. Secondly, the latest edition of China's standard map can be seen as a provocative political declaration effectively declaring a form of conflict with its neighboring nations. It has antagonized the entire ASEAN region, strained relations with Russia to the north, created tensions with India to the west, and sparked concerns from Taiwan and Japan to the east. The implications of this map should not be underestimated. Thirdly, the new map revision involves the inclusion of Bolshoi Ussurisky Island currently under Russian administration within Chinese territory. While this may seem relatively peaceful at the moment, it has the potential to ignite significant geopolitical conflicts. I believe that the CCP's actions in this regard have been premeditated. In February of this year, the CCP made a strategic move to test Russia's willingness to cooperate, taking advantage of Russia's current challenges and its reluctance to engage in confrontations with China. During that period, the CCP also issued a directive stating that in future Chinese maps, eight specific areas it desires to reclaim currently under Russian control must be labeled using official Chinese place names rather than just Russian translations. 
One prominent example is Vlada Vastak, which must be marked as Haishan Way on the maps. Despite some public discussions, there was no official response from the Russian government to this document. Now, with the release of the new map, the CCP has officially incorporated the entire Bosho Ussurisky Island into Chinese territory. This represents a further cautious step. And if Russian responds with minimal resistance, it may embolden China to take more significant actions in the future. So, the question arises, will Putin agree to return Bosho Ussurisky Island to China? Could the two countries privately negotiate a deal where Russia relinquishes control of the island, considering that Russia possesses an abundance of land and managing a border division through the middle of the island might be logistically complex? The answer is a resounding no. Putin's appetite for territorial expansion is on par with that of Xi Jinping. Both leaders adhere to a traditional monarch's perspective of enlarging their territories, believing that to secure a lasting legacy, territorial expansion is essential. Putin has demonstrated no reluctance in occupying Georgia and Ukraine, seeing it as a condition that aligns him with the likes of Tsar Peter the Great. Xi Jinping also exhibits a similar disposition, as evidenced by his actions in the South China Sea, confrontations with India, and now the inclusion of a Russian island into Chinese territory. Expanding territory is the primary means of making a mark on history. Putin will not entertain the idea of ceding Bolshoi Osirisky Island. Moreover, he cannot afford to do so, given the strong populist sentiments within Russia which are as potent as Chinese nationalism. Therefore, it is highly unlikely that Putin would ever agree to such a proposal. An even more significant question is whether Putin will become enraged over this. Some have jokingly wondered if Putin might launch a special military operation against Xi Jinping. I believe that at this point, Putin does not have the capacity or the inclination to take such drastic action openly. Instead, he is likely to lodge a diplomatic protest with China through diplomatic channels. On September 1st, the Russian foreign ministry rejected China's apparent claim of ownership over a disputed island that has been a source of tension between Moscow and Beijing for decades. In the current scenario, Putin finds himself in a somewhat vulnerable position, heavily dependent on China as a crucial part of his supply chain. Without China's support, Russia's prospects could be bleak. Consequently, Putin is compelled to adopt a more measured and cautious approach. Nevertheless, Putin has his means of expressing dissatisfaction. For example, he may suddenly make remarks pertaining to Taiwan as he has done in the past. This was particularly notable when Xi Jinping was engaged in military exercises seemingly preparing for potential military action against Taiwan. At that time, Putin abruptly commented that China had no need to use military force to take control of Taiwan since it would be futile. Such statements served to dampen Xi Jinping's apparent military readiness. Why did Putin make such a statement? It was because during that period, the prevailing public sentiment in China was in favor of using military force to deter Taiwanese independence. However, Putin essentially conveyed to Xi Jinping that whether Taiwan pursued independence or not was not China's concern and military action was unnecessary. China should have confidence and avoid resorting, uh, resorting to military means. Facing the current map controversy, Putin has refrained from an immediate response. It's quite probable that he might employ different means to convey his dissatisfaction with the CCP in other matters. For instance, he could offer robust support for Vietnam or Malaysia, or perhaps increase arms sales to India during period of heightened Sino-India tensions. Thus, Putin possesses various channels through which he can express his concerns. 
So, how did Chinese people respond to this new version of the standard map? Well, ardent the supporters of the Communist Party, often known as the Patriotic Youth or Little Pink, are naturally elated. They view Xi Jinping's move to reclaim territory that was supposedly ceded to Russia during Jiang Zemin's era as a significant triumph. This resonates with nationalists who see the expansion of China's territorial claims on maps in a positive light. However, Xi Jinping must proceed cautiously. Nationalism can be a double-edged sword and a moving target. While enlarging the map may currently win applause, in the future, those patriotic youth may push for concrete actions to align with the map. They could urge Xi Jinping to reclaim the territory and insist on tearing up border agreements with Russia for renegotiation. At that juncture, will Xi Jinping have the fortitude to follow through? Failure to do so could risk his political stature. With the release of the new map by the CCP, it appears that Xi Jinping believes he is now in a position to challenge Russia and potentially expand China's northern borders. This represents Xi Jinping's strategic move, but the success of this strategy ultimately hinges on Putin's response. Considering Putin's current strength and Russia's overall power, it is highly improbable that Putin will yield unless he faces a situation where he is on the brink of being ousted from power and Russia is on the verge of disintegration. Only in such dire circumstances with China providing life support to Putin could China potentially reclaim territory. However, in the present circumstances, particularly with the ongoing deadlock in the Ukraine conflict, Putin is unlikely to accede to Xi Jinping's territorial demands. Furthermore, even after Putin con consolidates his position, he will likely mount a strong counter-response because territorial matters are an issue of paramount sensitivity for Putin. He has taken considerable risk to acquire more land for Russia, and any loss of territory to China could jeopardize his presidency. Looking at this from this angle, Xi Jinping's decision to revise the map is quite audacious, and if it results in a clash with Putin, it might actually be a favorable outcome. Xi Jinping could potentially be even more daring. So, go Mr. Xi, go! Be bold! Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment and subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly. Until then, be well.